All right, hi everybody. I think it's that time. Let's um, let's get started. I want to talk a little bit more about force control today. Um, last week, uh, you know, my I have this new setup for uh, you know presenting iPad everything. It should hopefully go very well today. It's it flaked out of me like minutes before lecture last time, and then my contact force visualization didn't work. So I, sorry, I was a little off my game last time, but I think I can write all wrongs here. And in fact, um, playing, writing up the notes carefully from last Thursday, uh, I, I had a couple even, you know, better examples that, that I wanna show you today. So um, <clears throat> let's, let's continue our story of, of force control. Let's hope that, you know, my new technology works. So, I motivated it last time with good old scenario 09954, where we were trying to get the cheese it box up, right? And um, last time I gave you a teleop interface where I where we um, talked about trying to you know basically uh, use a much more dynamic strategy, a much more force based strategy to try to flip the cheese it box up. Um, I want to do a slight variant of that just very quickly, and it's written up carefully in the notes. But I think that even shows uh, even better what you can do if you start thinking in force space instead of position space. So, um, you know, this is the the version of, of the box that we did last time. We pushed it all to, all the way to the edge, and then we tried to maintain some frictional contact in the top corner and flip it up. And that is cool. That is a cool way to do it. But it um, it's uh, it's not a subtle way to do it because you can just apply lots of force and get the job done. Uh, if you instead want to try to flip the box up right in the middle of the bin, I like this one a lot better actually because um, you can't just power your way through this one. So now um, the goal will be to, to I, people can see my mouse, right? Yeah, okay. The goal will be to produce forces here on the edge of the cheese it box, which never cause this contact to leave its friction cone, right? There's a friction cone here and there's a friction cone here. And inside those, for, those pretty tough constraints on, on forces, we'd like to apply a, a force that will get up from the, you know, will rotate the box up. So if all goes well, I can show this to you directly here. So um, here's my force-based flip up control played in kind of comically slow motion for a couple of reasons, but let's start it up. Here's my little finger. It immediately goes into contact and then does a nice control. This is actually playing at uh, half speed just to, for dramatic effect. Um, but actually in this case, it's I think more impressive to go slowly uh, than to go quickly because it shows that you're in complete control of this you know, relatively slippery situation, if you will. Okay, so a very simple strategy, basically what I wrote last time, but now the constraints instead are that your force in the corner stays in the fr friction cone and the force in the top stays in the friction cone. And with that, under that constraint, we'd like to apply a moment on the box, okay? using a simple PID controller to, to, to configure the moment so you don't have to have information about the mass of the box. And the assumptions about the geometry of the box are actually really, um, really weak. I can actually flip this to be, um, just to show you that it, we have achieved mastery of the box. Uh, if I do it in teleop mode, Immediately, because it's trying to apply a force, it will it'll drive itself into contact. Remember that was one of the virtues of force control was that it will find its way into contact. And in, in most cases, if I'm commanding a force, uh, contact force, and it's not in contact, it will drive itself into contact. And then now I can just on a slider, um, you know, start. I have basic mastery of the angle, and it will never apply forces that will leave the contact. And it's actually it's pretty beautiful because. Um, for instance, if I'm down in the bottom, the, the hard part actually, if you go to try this at home, uh, Terry and I were, were playing with it, right? It's actually, you have to have significant enough friction in the, in the corner for it to actually be achievable. 
And the reason for that is that in the down configuration here, this is the finger's gonna pop off in a second, but um, <clears throat> in the down configuration, uh, if your friction cone here is too small or your friction cone here is too small, then it might not be possible to actually generate a moment without causing the other force to slide. So if you try it on a box on a slippery table, you'll just simply not be able to do the task. Uh, if you put a little bit more friction down, then you, you'll see you can do the task just like this. And the coefficient of friction by default here is, is um, the coefficient of friction are one, which is a relatively high coefficient of friction. And so the task is possible. Uh, the nice thing about writing the controller as a quadratic program, the way we did last time, is, um, whoop, there goes my finger. Yeah, so it's, it eventually slipped off because of the, uh, the fact that Drake models friction with, as, a, as a damping, basically, and will eventually, it'll slide up and go. But um, I guess I can stop the simulation. The beautiful thing about having that, um, the least constrained least squares formulation of the problem is that in the case where no forces are possible, there are no um, feasible forces that you could generate that would to satisfy the orientation command without violating the friction constraint, then it will simply not move the box, right? So it'll just go up, it'll refuse to command something that will leave the friction cone because that's a hard constraint and the orientation is just an objective. So you'll just see if mu is too small, it'll, the box will sit there and the finger will happily sit on the side. Only when it becomes feasible will it um, will it go up and start rotating. Any questions on that? I mean, I think that is just such a cool. That's a that's such a clear example in my mind of um, of a place where reasoning about the forces explicitly allows you to do something that would be extremely hard to do if uh, if you weren't reasoning about the forces. If you were just trying to plan some position of the finger over time or something like that. It's very, very hard to, to keep that inside the friction cone. Okay, so um, you don't have to, so, so, so I think this is the extreme case where we really are commanding forces directly and uh, we're putting constraints on forces directly. I wrapped an outer loop control which was more like a position control on the orientation of the box, but I still ran that through a force control lower, lower loop because I needed to put the constraints directly on the forces. Um, so you might find yourself asking, you know, do I have to choose? Do I have to set my lower level control to be just in force control mode? You know, can I do position control mode? Is there any way to sort of mix the two? Okay, and there's and it's very standard actually to 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 go back and forth between the two. Um, so um, you know, the, there's a, the classic idea is called hybrid force and position control. And if you find yourself in a situation where you'd like to command forces in one axis, and you have a separate axis for which you want to have more position control. Then, then that's a very standard thing to do. You just simply uh, write your controller sort of in one, in one axis completely in terms of forces. You could write your controller in the second axis completely in terms of positions. And that's called hybrid force control. A classic reason to do that would be if you wanted to, for instance, do edge following. Um, if you wanted to like scrub a table, for instance, if you wanted to push that book for in, uh, on the table. But if there's something where you want to apply a certain amount of force in an axis, let's say to, to follow a wall, to follow an edge or something like this, but you have a goal of, of producing some, Cartesian, some trajectory in the other axes, that's a classic example of doing hybrid force uh, control, which means position in some modes, uh, force in other, in other directions. And we're gonna explore a little bit of that on the problem set, I believe. <clears throat> okay, so, um, but programming forces is, uh, is not the only way to, so pro programming forces directly is not the only way to sort of take advantage of some of the ideas from force control. And I should say um, that even if you, if you think that this kind of control is sort of the, the old style way to do control and really, you know, there, there are people out there, I happen to not really be one of them that sort of say, you know, reinforcement learning has happened and, uh, you know, it's awesome, control is hard, I'm glad I don't have to do that anymore because reinforcement learning will save everything. 
But I, I hope you view all of this as um, I actually think reinforcement learning can help a lot. I'm a big uh, believer in parts of it, but I still think you have basic questions about, for instance, if I'm going to have a reinforcement learning controller, what outputs should it have? What inputs should it have? Should you give it the position of the arm as measurements? Should you give it a force sensor as measurements? You know, should you ask it to command positions of the arm? Should you ask it to ask it to command forces uh, of the end effector, for instance? Or you know, we're going to see in a second, you could imagine commanding virtual forces or impedances. And um, you know, all of those things will change the ability of your system to learn, the ability to generalize to new tasks. And I think they're relatively well understood in this more classic context. So, um, so this is good stuff to know all around. Okay, so um, there is another essential idea uh, for controlling forces, which is to instead of controlling forces directly, which we did, you can try to control, act, make your system act as if it's a mechanical system that applies forces. So let me let me let me uh, let me say that more carefully here. Everybody can see that it's updating. It's reasonably high resolution. Yes. Whew. Okay. Um, the direct force control is what we just did um, versus indirect force control. Okay. In indirect force control, what we're going to do is we're going to try to make our system act like a, a mechanical system that applies forces. And it's in, in some ways you could think of it as a generalization of the direct force control. There are some tasks that are much more natural to write this way. So um, let me give you an example. If I were to have a simple, um, let me give it wheels to make it clear that we're not gonna worry about the friction for a second here. If I have a mass with a spring and a damper attached to some wall, for instance, this is a mechanical system. We know how to write its equations in motion. It would be say maybe with some set points equals whatever, if I apply some force here, it might be some, some force like this, okay? So if I were to, um, to, to push on this force, I think we understand everything about how this system is gonna respond. Uh, it's going to respond like a nice, you know, mechanical system. If I'm moving through the world, then maybe the right way to think about um, the robot, if I have, you know, random obstacles that I'm, objects I'm trying to pick up, maybe I should actually move my finger now, my gripper, through the world. Oh, this is my gripper. As if it's just some mechanical system attached to, to this. So that when, if, if it does bump into something, the object I'm trying to pick up, a wall that I didn't expect or whatever, instead of commanding the force directly, it, I will, I'll set this, the rest length of these springs. I'll, I'll push it around, for instance, but I'll let the response of the, of the contact forces, which are potentially unknown, be governed by the dynamics of the spring, okay? So these, what we wanna do is instead of uh, programming a force directly, we're gonna, program a, a force-like interaction, a spring-like interaction. And this is the, um, this is called stiffness control. It's actually interesting. MIT is important in the history of these, um, of these topics. Uh, this was stiffness control was originally, originally by Salisbury who was at MIT back then, but is now at Stanford. So instead of programming a force, I'll program a stiffness, meaning my, my, the stiffness of my spring, okay? And in the point finger case, where my dynamics were originally just mx double dot equals u plus some contact forces, right? This was 
this is what I, the dynamics of my point finger. You can imagine what U I should command in order to change this equation to make it to behave exactly like this equation, right? If I were to write a control law that looked like, you know, negative K X minus X zero minus B X dot, then for instance, I'm gonna achieve exactly my goal of acting like a spring. The cool thing is this control, this kind of a controller has nice properties, nice behavior, um, even when you have a lot of uncertainty about the, um, about the contact forces, right? So I'm not asking you in any way to write, when I write, when we write this controller, we're not asking you in any way to make some detailed model of the contact force, okay? If you do, however, um, want to prove something about the closed loop system, then this can also be a nice thing to do um, because you can lean on something called passivity theory. There's also, there's a whole discipline on this called on Port Hamiltonian systems. I, I put a reference in the note. Okay, so if you wanted to say it's uh, some people care a great deal about proving that their robot when they're in, even though it's moving through the world, in fact, the people who built the EWA care a great deal about show about giving some guarantees that even if, the, if as long as the robot's moving through the world, even though it's in a force control kind of setup where it's doing, uh, it's controlling a stiffness like this, um, it's never going to do something completely crazy. It's never going to go unstable. Acting like a well-behaved mechanical system is a nice way to give that sort of a guarantee. You can say, my system acts like a mechanical spring mass damper system. It will never create energy. You know, if, I'm, if I hold the set point constant, then energy will only be dissipated, right? If you put that mechanical system, which we understand and we control and we've commanded into the world, and if the world is also well-behaved, if you, all you have to maybe assume about the world is that it's not gonna inject energy in your system, right? So if the world were to come up to your robot and go and start pushing you at your harmonic, uh, you know, at your at your resonant frequency, then all bets are off. But if you say that the world is a passive system, not trying to um, do anything bad, then you can actually argue that for a whole class of, of worlds, uh, my system with no details of modeling the world, except for saying that it's energy dissipation, uh, it's, it's in energy dissipation, can I can gar give guarantees of stability. Okay, so that's a very nice, sort of set of guarantees that you might like to give. But what I really want you to think about here is that in some cases, this is actually a very natural way to program a task, okay? And actually the thing that I gave you, the teleop interface that I gave you last time was doing this sort of a control. And I, I worked on the interface to make it a little bit more obvious um, that that is happening. So let me show you now This version of the task, I've made my cheese it box transparent, semi-transparent. So, and I've given myself uh, two fingers now, uh, a virtual finger, and which is the one that I'm commanding, which is the set point of my spring, and the actual finger. Okay, so the the virtual finger is a bright orange kind of color, and there's the actual finger. And I have the same sort of interface I gave you last time, but you can see now as I move around, and uh, you know. The virtual finger is ahead of, and the, the real finger is going to chase my, my virtual finger. Okay, and as I push it down here, when I go into contact, now the forces that are being applied on the block are being applied because I've got my spring mass damper system and I've pushed it up against the, the block. And it's my set point of my spring. My, my, my spring is trying to get me back to where the, um, where the actual, where the virtual thing is. My finger is actually here. So I'm acting like a, a spring in, in tension uh, that's trying to apply forces. And the more that I push this thing into penetration, the larger those forces are gonna be. And at some point it's gonna push the block across, right? All right, now 
this is the good one. <laughs> how do we flip this task? How, how do we flip the block up? And why did I make it actually almost too easy for you last time? You can think about, you know, there's a lot of subtlety in how you might want to flip this thing up. We, we said we last time we were talking about rotating around this corner. We want to apply forces here. We want to apply a torque here. You can imagine that if I lift the virtual set point up here, then I'll start applying a moment in addition to the, the contact force. That seems all good. Once I get near the top though, inevitably this corner is going to slip. I still want to complete the task. At that point, this thing happens, it's gonna happen in a moment. Once it goes, it's just gonna go super fast. Like if you're waiting for a controller that's trying to detect that moment and then trying to, to you know, plant, start a new planter and push down in the top corner in order to complete the motion, good luck to you, right? But if I were to just say, I'm, I'm a finger, I'd like to be, you know, I've got a rest length somewhere over here, right? Then what's gonna happen as I start applying those forces And I, boom, right? So not only did the finger go up, but once it came here, it was automatically tuned. It was automatically already set to being pushed down, to push down to the box and complete the move, right? Let me actually do that one more time because some weird uh, dialogue popped up right in the middle of my sliders as I was doing that. Now in, reasonable speeds. Okay. So I'm going to push this here. I'm going to set my finger somewhere over here. And then I'm going to start lifting it up. And I'm going to count on the mechanics of that spring that's trying to pull me towards the, the set point to do all the work, boom, and get me right into position. Okay. So what I've done is I've, I've programmed my finger to act like a mechanical system, which is, you know, doing that whole task. The beautiful thing about that is I can act. So, so if you looked at if you look at that the equations I put up, right? There's nothing about in these equations about the forces. There's nothing about the box. If you have if all you have to know is you have to understand your robot, in order to make your robot act at the end effector as if it's some mechanical system, and if you program it to act like the right mechanical system, with applying force, you know, around this axis, boom then you can accomplish sometimes incredibly cool and sophisticated tasks. Take a breath there. Anybody have any questions? Ooh, ah, maybe? If you do want to ooh or ah, you can unmute to do that. Uh, uh, the obvious next question that I'm sure you're coming to momentarily is how do you decide that set point so that cool. you actually get that happening? So. Um, because otherwise we've just, we have a magic number before that we solved with a quadratic program. And now we have some other magic number or sequence of magic numbers that is, have we, have we gained anything in that respect? Good. And it's a subtle point. Um, thank you for that. Uh, it's a subtle point, but I did not like memorize what, uh, 1.2, you know, or it's a sort of, you know, 0.12 and 0.23 or whatever. I just kind of, eh, I want it somewhere over here somewhere that's gonna be enough to pull it up here and push it down here. I'm gonna be different every time. And um, so basically I think for a controller of this form, you can be quite sloppy with your choice of set points and still accomplish the task. And for a wide range of boxes, okay? You could imagine, um, yeah, I think you could imagine writing a pretty simple strategy for you know, a wide variety of boxes that would sort of always accomplish this particular task. So there is a number to pick again, a, a set point to pick, but I think the it's a much bigger target. Awesome question. Okay, so um, stiffness control is. Uh, I think simple to think about in terms of point fingers. Uh, we're gonna, I'll, I'll show you how to think about it in terms of the whole manipulator, but actually I don't wanna spend too much time on it. It was, it was really good feedback last time. I think that, um, and I think actually most of the treatments you'll see in the literature about force control and impedance control and all the like 
Um, there are so many details which are actually super important to get right if you want to get a high performance system. You know, whether you measure force and, and command positions, whether you're measuring accelerations, whether you have good torque sensors, whether you have force control, you know, um, even just the resolution of independent uh, sensors and actuators, the bandwidth that you have, all those things matter and it causes like this shattering of different papers and approaches and it'll make your head spin. If you understand the point finger case, then you're like 99% of the way there. And I'm, and you'll, you'll have some, when you have your particular robot and you wanted to make, eke out the last bits of performance, then you're going to go down that, that, uh, you know, decision tree and try to figure out exactly which way to implement these kind of things. But the key idea is that you can just knowing your, um, your dynamics of your robot, not the environment, you can program it to act in a certain way. Good. So is M the, the in my little picture here, uh, what I, that's okay. You asked exactly the right question. Now maybe, maybe I understand the, the bigger thing here. So um, M could be in this example, the mass of the finger. In this, in this case, I wrote the mass of the finger here and I applied this controller, which had nothing to do with M. And so I have added a spring mass damper, but I haven't changed the effective mass. So whatever the mass of my finger was, which in case in this case was one, um, I'm gonna it's gonna act like a spring mass damper with a mass one. You can write a controller, and that's in fact the super important point here. Impedance control says you should be able to program the entire response, which means you could even um, change the the effective mass of your uh, of your finger or of your robot. Changing that effective mass, you know, this is partly where the, um, where the variety of different approaches are. Uh, depending on how you write it, changing the effective mass can require force sensing. It might require acceleration sensing. Uh, it typically requires more bandwidth. So we're thinking about, we've been writing these things in continuous time. We haven't been thinking about how fast am I updating the command to my actuator and how fast are my sensors taking measurements and how well am I filtering them. But when you start trying to invert mass, then those details start to come in play, into play. Yes, exactly what Sebastian says. You could, you could be adding an extra term proportional to the acceleration, but Measuring acceleration is something to be done carefully or, or avoided. And, uh, uh, and, and measuring force is some, something that you can also do to, to, to accomplish that. It's, I mean, there's an important point in impedance control. You don't have to measure acceleration in order to accomplish impedance control. But um, in practice, it's, uh, historically, I was actually talking to Tomas about this uh, last year, and uh, I think you know, Salisbury sort of said in st stiffness control, Hogan said impedance control. I think a lot of people have done a lot of good work in the, in the middle. I think most times, even like the EWA controller as an example, I think most of the times people are saying it's not worth the extra co complexity and bandwidth requirements to try to change the effective mass. And it's, uh, you can still program a lot of responses and just leave the mass of your robot effectively as is. Okay, so Chip cheese it box flipping is like an awesome application, right? I mean, big time. But it's not the one that actually caused all of this uh, to go. Uh, you know, it didn't cause all the research that happened here. There's a classic example of a problem that everybody thought about early on that that inspired a lot of this research. And I would be remiss to not uh, make sure you you talk. I talk to talk about it a little bit. Um, one of them, you know, there's this idea of peg and hole insertion. And I want to pull up uh, one of the particular, you know, MIT theses from 1977. Uh, what? Pretty cool. Yeah. Name's Drake. So um, peg and hole insertion is like a classic problem for, for, for robots. And it's actually still a problem today, right? So um, robots at that time, uh, the, the, one of the main applications was to try to do uh, small parts. Well, even today, people are still trying to do small parts assembly, but even large parts assembly back then. And you had big robots 
trying to, to jam um, you know, parts into, into very precise assemblies with very small tolerances. Like C was the little measurement error tolerance that, that they had in, in uh, Samuel's thesis, okay? And um, it's interesting, his, his, his thesis actually, if you, if you read it, it starts off, it says, well, we noticed that actually our grippers, even though we tried to make them very, um, very rigid, you know, the, the part would inevitably uh, be a little bit compliant in the, in the gripper, right? Inevitably, there was some amount. And in, in, in some cases, in particular, if there was a little bit of chamfer on, the, on either the part or on the insertion in the hole, then actually it seemed like the compliance, uh, the natural compliance in the fingertip was actually in, the most, in most cases working in their favor. So, um, so it became a natural question, can we use force control to, to command that compliance and, um, and possibly improve the, the, the response and you know, have tighter fingers when possible and, and, and use force control to do it. Um, Samuel's thesis actually turned out to be, uh, uh, he said, we started off thinking we were gonna do everything with force control and we ended up realizing that you can do everything even better with mechanical um, uh, stiffness. And that's one of the big things that I'll, that I'll mention about in a second here. Um, in fact, well, let me show you right away. This is the device in, in, you know, in his thesis of a, a remote centered compliance device, okay? Which is, it looks kind of scary, um, but, but in practice, it's, it's almost exactly what we have been talking about here. I'll draw some pictures here. Let me flip. Okay. Got a hole, we got a peg coming in at some exaggerated bad angle. The question is, um, how should we program our robot to, to behave, okay? Um, if there's a little bit of chamfer, there's a couple important cases, right? So the one that he drew nicely. If I'm coming down here and I bump into the, the wall right here and I get a, um, a force of contact here, if I allow some compliance in, in this direction, then, uh, then actually the part might just slide into place and go down, commanding even positions in this direction and being compliant in this direction could solve the task. Okay, the more interesting case is actually when you start um, worrying about orientation too. Even if you have that chamfer, if you're coming down at a bad angle and you get a, a, a contact force like this, then actually pushing away, you know, if, the, if you allow the force to push you away, that could actually do the wrong thing. And there's a really bad thing that happens, which is if you get in the hole when that happens and you're partly in the hole already, and then you bump into that and rotate away, you can actually do get jammed. Jamming. And there's lots of papers about jamming and the like where you basically, if you have a, a contact here and a contact here, um, your ability to measure those forces up at the top gets really, uh, you basically lost the ability to infer what's happening down at the end effector. And uh, you can get extremely large forces uh, that will cause uh, problems for sort of any control strategy. Yes, so decreasing the mass can cause instability issues too. That's exactly what, I, that's exactly the, the bandwidth limitations. Uh, uh, so Dale, yeah, absolutely, I, I agree. Okay, so, um, so what are we to do here? Let's take an impedance type control uh, and try to program the mechanical compliance that we'd like to, to have. Um, and the key idea is to have, uh, have compliance in both directions. You know, we said that up here, having a compliance in this direction is good, but we also wanna have some compliance in orientation. 
The question is, what should that compliance look like, right? Our end effector is way up here. And so far we've been writing like a, a, you know, a compliance in the end effector coordinates, right? But if our hole is way down here, then what's gonna happen? Right. If I have a, if I program some rotational compliance um, into my hand, and I get a force like this, then which way is it going to rotate? Right. That's actually going to cause the, if the sort of the, the center of compliance is up here, then that's going to cause a moment that's going to allow the the part to rotate actually in the wrong direction. So you'd like to somehow have a remote center of compliance. RCC. And it's no big deal, right? Just the way we had a remote set point of our spring, you can say, I'd like my system to act like it's a mechanical system that has a set point here and is pulling me in, in that direction. All right, so the question I'd like you to think about for a second here is, where is the ideal center for the com for compliance? If I want to insert my peg and have it, um, you know, passively write itself, where would you like the center to be? And so here's a, here are a couple of candidates. Somewhere down here seems like a good candidate, maybe aligned with the entry point of the hole seems like a good candidate, maybe slightly above the hole seems like a good candidate. What would you pick for your compliance? It's not easy to think about. There's a lot of cases. I think you'll agree that if I have a kind of a, this is my torsional spring up at the top here. Um, if I get a contact force like this, and I call this my center of compliance, then I'm going to tilt this way. So for this, this example right here, that seems not so good. Okay. If I can put my center of compliance very low, then I could have sort of the opposite effect. I apply a force here, which for instance happens like this, then it's actually gonna tip um, the opposite direction, right? The same force I applied here will now make this the thing tip in the opposite direction. And in fact, in this case here, if my center is down here, for instance, that will cause a tipping moment in this direction. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I can't see the very bottom of whatever you're drawing on. Oh, nice. Thank you for saying that. Good. I think I know how to fix that, but I will not attempt it right now. I have like hidden windows, sharing hidden windows, sharing hidden windows. <laughs> Okay, and so it sounds good to put it low, but um, in terms of the orientation, but remember we also want um, to handle sort of this initial impact, I guess, in, you know, this case up here.
So the classic answer is what we should you, what you should do is you should program the robot to have this point as our as your remote center compliance, the bottom of your part tip. Okay. The reason for that is if you look at the different cases. my part comes into contact like this and I get a force like this, then it's actually going to, it will move in the wrong direction, but it will have a relatively small moment around this point. And the bulk of the response will actually be the horizontal response. Okay. When I'm down in the hole, could move, but this force here is then going to cause the entire gripper to, to rotate this way. And that's what I want. Okay. So we can absolutely achieve that with, um, with a basic impedance control type model based approach. For the super type tolerance, if you read these papers, they will say you can't typically achieve it with 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 active control that these passive devices like the one i've got on my slide here um can achieve tasks that the active control cannot and it's precisely because of this um the bandwidth and sensor issues right so if i can make the, a mechanical spring implement this the same um maneuver then i have infinite bandwidth no sensing to worry about no sensor noise nothing like this right so it can accomplish the task beautifully and the amazing thing is that um, these mechanical systems with the, with the right cleverness in terms of where you put the springs can actually, there's a sort of a natural center of uh, up, up here and there's the desired center of compliance down here. And by changing the relative stiffness of these springs and setting it up in a clever configuration, you can basically move the actual center of compliance down farther into the into the part. And these are real systems that get used, right? So, um, you know, this is maybe the simpler version that actually, you know, after, after people really understood it, they boil it down to its essentials. And these are this is what um, systems tend to look like today. And you will see that they can account for both position errors and orientation errors, aligning the part with the whole. So cool. Remote center compliance. So this is a, you know, a real mechanical one by ATI. They're narrating and, uh, you know, for for vendors of of parts manufacturers. But the point is, big stiff robot, okay, mechanical compliance. There's a relatively tight tolerance insertion happening here. In this case, the peg is on the ground, and the uh, there's a there's holes, and they are jamming that eighty twenty down at rel at very high speeds. And I, that's the point, right? Is that, uh, you know, that is a high tolerance task. The thing is not aligned when it's coming down and it's sliding into position just due to the, look at that chunk, nice. Um, uh, just due to the compliance in the RCC. Super cool, okay. It turns out um, this isn't just like a thing of the 1970s. Uh, this came up again in my life just, just a couple of weeks ago because the folks at Dexi, which are, uh, they're in town and they're um, building robots to be a sous chef. Um, they have a, sort of exactly the same classic problem of trying to do peg, insert, peg and hole insertion. So their problem is they have these, these robots that are um, you know, trying to basically do the Chipotle or whatever kind of uh, you know kind of thing where they're they're dishing out items from a bin to try to make a salad. Apparently, the health codes are such that you can't have like a tool changer off to the side where you can like carefully control exactly where the the tool is and and uh, you know just go and grab it, which is the classic tool change. You know, you could allow everything to be very high precision. You could you can instrument. Um, for health code reasons, the 
tool actually has to be in contact with the food at all times that it's not being used so that it maintains temperature alignment. So it basically, um, you want the temperature of your tool to stay at the same temperature as your food, okay? Uh, not my area of expertise, but that, that's a, something coming down from the, the, the health code. So what they have is this clever setup where they've got their tools all positioned waiting for, uh, for the tool changer to come in, different tools for every bin. And they have this problem, a peg and hole insertion problem effectively of trying to get their robot to pick up the right, um, you know, to mate with the right part in order to do the scoop. And they're saying, they were saying that, that, you know, that insertion part is as hard as the scooping or any, any of the other um, maneuvers that they're doing, right? Now, I think uh, this is a very different situation than the super high tolerance, um, you know, must be mechanical because your bandwidth is just not good enough case that we had in the factories. Uh, this is a case where I think virtual compliance can do the job and you might not want, for all the variety of things that this robot's doing, you might not want to have a remote centered compliance here adding, you know, changing the dynamics of the end effector for all of the different behaviors. Well, there are a bunch of questions on the chat. If, uh, oh, awesome. It's the right time. Okay, so good. So, so how does it change if you have a dual peg to insert, which is what the video showed? Didn't even think about that. Um, I'm thinking mostly in terms of where you want that remote center of compliance to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's, I mean, you could see where it was, and it was kind of centered on the, the tool in, the, in um, the video. And I think that would have the right rough behavior. It would be um, if you had your center of compliance roughly between those two pins, both of them, even though it's spread out, both of them have ex sort of exactly the same picture that we had. It would be, just be like a wide uh, version of, our, of a single hole insertion. And I think it should do the right thing. It's a good question. We should draw like the free body diagram carefully and, and see it. Um, Rebecca, I, so I was being a little sloppy with the, I was emphasizing the horizontal component, but you're right, it would, uh, the force would be, well, depending on what, where the robot's moving, I think that the, uh, the normal is not, it would be on the chamfer would be like this, right? And I, I wanna to react to the um, horizontal component. Oh, okay, so I, I said that in the context of having a small moment. And so um, draw, it can draw a conveniently pointed vector to make my moment look small. But I still think that those moments, uh, you know, the, the, the arm, the length, you know, the R cross V of that moment is still very small, so I think um, you know, you lose a little bit there, but I think you, uh, you do win by having the remote center compliance very down. Yeah, so good. So if you had an active control system instead of a passive one, then you can actually move the center compliance uh, dynamically. Absolutely. Yay for active control. The bad part is, you know, all of the sensing and bandwidth requirements. Nice. So it turns out that um, you know being compliant like that really, I think it really does uh, change the way we do control. Um, we use it, you know. Th this, I think, even if you don't care about peg insertions exactly, I think that you'll see in lots of applications having this type of programmed compliance can help. So. The example that we had in um, the dish loading case is even in just opening the door, okay? The robot is in a compliant mode there and it dramatically reduces the tolerance of the, I mean, we had to get the finger inside the, um, you know, inside the lip of the, the handle there, but the arc of the door, you know, if, if the dishwasher is slightly in a location or orientation that we didn't expect, then tracking with a very high you know, position control, basically uh, that arc of the door would be bad news. And, uh, yeah, and tracking with a more compliant controller is actually quite viable. So these things really affect the, you know, what you can do, whether if you're 
if you want the robot to you know open doors and take over the world, then you need force control maybe. Cool. So in practice, actually, um, the control we're using in that dish loading example is not the um, the remote centered compliance control I just said. We're using a slightly different version of it. And let me try to dig in a little bit to that now. So for the most part, I want this to be, you know, I want this to be a detail, right? The idea, the key idea, even though I will put a couple of equations up, but not many, um, the key idea is that uh, you only have to know the dynamics of your robot in order to program its response to an unknown force, right? That is the absolute essential idea. And basically, you know, the internal dynamics of the robot, we're gonna say, you know, we can take as much time as we want to calibrate the mass inertia properties. The KUKA robots, they do a um, you know, pretty uh, extensive job of trying to identify the friction in the joints and in the, in the transmissions, and they try to cancel that out actively, okay? And, um, you know, you can do a lot of work on the robot. I'm sort of willing philosophically to do as much work as I need to, to system ID, you know, calibrate whatever my robot. And I, and I think if you ask for any of the same amount of work to happen about the environment, then you're gonna put yourself in a, in a small little narrow thing. So there's a very big gap, gulf in my mind about how much we should expect about knowing the model for the stuff on the robot versus the stuff in the world. Even just knowing what's on the robot and having a high quality robot with a carefully calibrated model is enough to program your response. But the, the, the way you do it and the, the choices you make are, you know, something I want to just understand a little bit here, okay? So <clears throat> we said before, for one joint, we wanted to program the system to be like a spring mass damper system, right? The, the manipulator equations the more complicated ones where I have gravity. So this is my M times A basically. And then I have gravity plus my control input plus any contact forces. Let me just write it as a single contact force right now. That depends on Q, okay. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes we'll call this even this contact force. A lot of times in joint space, we'll just say this, we call this tau external. It's those, those things that we didn't model carefully. It's the, what the world is doing to me, but in my joint coordinates roughly, okay, as a generalized force. Now, um, we could try to cancel out with this arbitrary terms. We could try to change the effective mass, like we said. Um, for the most part, I think the, the, the world is converging on, just go ahead and leave that alone. It's too much work to try to change the effective mass. And, uh, and these things remember kind of go together, right? So you, so you wouldn't try to cancel, you probably wouldn't try to cancel this one out independent of trying to change the mass because really that's just a coordinate dependent way to write mass times acceleration. So we're gonna leave this side alone, but we're gonna write a controller that cancels out the gravity, okay? and then imparts some sort of um, some dynamics that I want, okay? 
The simplest way to do that is a joint impedance control or stiffness control, if you like. Stiffness control being a subset of impedance control. So I think people often say impedance control, even if they're just setting a stiffness and damping. So we'd like to make our system look like a spring mass damper system here, we'll call it KP. Um, and you can imagine what control U you'd have to put, you'd have to type in to just subtract this out, add those terms in, okay? And you can, um, you can implement this controller sort of very easily. Well, I say that, but there's actually a ton of details in making this work, work well. In, in practice, actually, um, you remember the argument that I said about um, trying to make an argument about st stability or safety because of the mechanical, whether you're adding energy into the system when the set point is fixed or not, the passivity theory. So in practice, actually, the, the KUKA robots the, that were originally developed and controlled at DLR, the German Space Agency, um, they worried a great deal about certifying that robot and, uh, and about the passivity arguments that they could make in terms of um, safety and stability. So actually, they, they do implement an abstraction like this, but the controller they use to do it doesn't just add torques here using their sensed torques. They actually do a, go through, jump through hoops in order to convert the, um, the, imply, the, the stiffness command into the actuator side coordinates. So they can absolutely guarantee that they don't, like if they're gonna deviate from this control law in any way, they're gonna deviate in a way that does not add energy into the system when the set points are fixed. And um, there's, there's a nice way to think about these sort of torque based, um, you know, compliant elastic joint robots uh, that allows them to, to write the motor equations, the link dynamics and the, and, the, and the manipulator equations and basically do the same work. Uh, I'll, I'll put that in the notes, but I decided to, not, to leave it out of the, of the lecture here. Um, but, but basically there's a simple set of equations that in the case where the, the actuators are nicely aligned with the joints and stuff like this, the equations are pretty simple, but there's a lot of work that goes into make sure you can still make a passivity argument. Okay, so um, so what does this robot act like, right? So we didn't try to change the mass and there is something there that, that is notable, which is um, we do have a configuration dependent mass, okay? So if your robot is in a different position and you push on it, for instance, it's gonna seem heavier in some configurations, lighter in some configurations effectively. And we're just gonna say, you know what, that's okay. Uh, it's too hard to cancel that out. Okay, but, but once we've established that, uh, we can do wonderful uh, things. The other version of this is, um, is end effector impedance control. And um, roughly, we're gonna change coordinates from Q to the end effector coordinates, which is effectively multiplies everything through with a Jacobian transform. This is often called operation space control. And you can write the dynamics in your end effector coordinates and apply a similar transformation here to establish a stiffness in the end effector coordinates. Those are actually different modes of the KUKA, like in the hardware pedestal, you, the pendant, you can basically say, am I in end effector mode? Am I in joint impedance control mode? And uh, we tend to choose joint impedance control mode for reasons that I will make clear in a minute. But let me first show you, um, you know, intuitively, I think, what, the, what those things look like. So the first thing you always ask about your force controller is how well have you modeled your robot and how accurate is your force controller? And the test for that is gravity compensation, okay? So if you can basically make your robot act like it's not there, right? Which was what we, exactly what we had to do. We had to subtract out the gravity terms. 
then you get behaviors that look like this. Your end effector is basically floating. Now, again, in the hardware controller that is running on KUKA, you can actually add the inertia, the lumped inertia of your end effector. You tell the hardware about the lumped inertia of your end effector so that it can include that in its low level high bandwidth controller. Yeah. If, the, if it's a multi-jointed end effector, then you're still just giving it a lumped inertia. So any effects of like the hand moving up and opening and closing or whatever are not being compensated for by its high accuracy controller. Okay. But in this regime then, you can actually flexibly set the stiffness of the different joints, the stiffness of the different end effector. And the end effector control, I think that they have a couple of really nice videos here. Um, it sort of shows this the virtues of having uh, the ability to set those compliances at the end effector, right? So this is now very soft in translation, very stiff in terms of rotation. Now he's flipped it. So he says it's very soft in terms of rotation, very stiff in terms of translation. Okay, that's, that's a, a type of example. In the impedance control mode, if you, if you want to somehow blend your position com command with uh, force command, you can do it sort of in the, high, in the impedance control world by effectively setting different stiffnesses. I guess I forgot to make this one autoplay, apologies, but if you play that next one, So if you take a look at the numbers too, 5,000 Newton meters, we're gonna show you what we actually use, we tend to use on our robots, 300 Newton meters here. you know, ranging between 100 and 2000 kind of Newton meters there. So getting a demo like that requires, you know, um, it is a statement about how well you've compensated for friction, how well you've compensated for the gravity of the robot. Um, but it's, it's also a statement about the quality of your sensor readings and filtering and the like and your bandwidth on your robot. And they, they were actually um, you know, very proud of having put a compliant robot, you know, because the, there is really compliance in the gear chains. It's much stiffer than a Baxter, but much, um, but much softer than like a, one of the other KUKAs that you actually see on the screen right now. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, but they're still able to get this very, you know, high performance control out of that, you know, squishy robot. And one of the people that was working on the safety case for this, um, Sammy Haddadin, kind of had, a, had fun with it, uh, trying to show this was, so Sammy's like now a distinguished professor, but, but back, uh, back in the day, he was a grad student, you know, and, and uh, was trying to show that this sort of uh, high bandwidth, re responsive, you know, torque control, a uh, robot can enable safe interaction with robots and humans, okay? Human volunteer, Sammy. Uh, again, that's the, the DLR. I'm gonna fast forward in mind, sorry to do that. But Sammy went through a series of experiments where he tried to show that it was actually, it's actually safe to interact with this robot, that it can detect unexpected contact by just watching the tau external. There's actually a nice line of work about how do you detect where the contact happened, but just watching the, uh, the tau external um, sort of measurement, the contact, which is the joint based version of the uh, you know, contact forces, then you can say contact happened and you can stop very quickly to the point where it's uh, safe. I don't actually remember what happened there. <laughs> And just to you know, fast forward a little bit here, but if you go to, let's say, 3:30, you'll see that you know Sammy made made an impact, let's say, in the field by uh, by slamming himself in the head with a with a KUKA. 
uh, that's a pretty memorable thing, and it was a it was a good thing for human robot interaction. Oddly, and I won't play the whole line, but I did include it for you if you want. There's a version of it with a you know big kuka and a knife that tries to stop without hurting the 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 meat, but. Watch that on your own time if you like. <laughs> you know, sharp knife coming down, trying to detect con unexpected contact forces quickly, and uh, you know, trying to stop without without digging in. Okay, let me pause and just to ask for any questions. Let's see. Oh, why isn't there a control input in that equation? Oh, good. So yes, so I used control to make the system act like a mechanical system only, right? Yes, most intuitive way, good. Okay, Terry took care of that one. Any other questions? I have a question for you. Um, we tend to, um, use the robot in joint impedance control mode instead of end effector impedance control mode and do any transformations to applying forces ourselves, even though we can only do that at lower bandwidths than the tightest feedback loop that, um, that KUKA has. Typically, you know, the closer you are to the, the low level control, the better, you know, they're operating at a, at a higher frequency than you can send commands to their controller. But we actually choose to just command uh, joint impedances and if we want to apply forces at an end effector, like in that book example, we do that um, ourselves. So why would we do that? Why is that the preference? It's not a, you know, it's not like we'll never revisit the decision, but um, but there is there is something about the end effector control. Um, it's because the Jacobian can be ill-conditioned near singularities. That's that's an excellent point. That's not actually the reason I was thinking of. Um, but there are there are versions of this where that are safe. In fact, um, you know, Neville's classic papers on impedance control talk a lot about uh, you know avoiding any ever taking an inverse of, of the Jacobian, and you know, this class of controllers is to be preferred, so you don't end up in worrying about singularities and stuff like that. So there are ways around that, but that is a good thing to worry about. What else? There's sort of something different about the home or the, I guess the, the robots of today, you know, the, the robot applications, manipulation applications of today versus the ones we were doing on the factory before that makes me favor at least the joint impedance. There's a, there's a sneaky thing that happens in, you need a finer touch when operating near humans. So you could imagine setting gains, similar levels of gains uh, in end effector coordinates or the um, joint coordinates. So I think you could have a similar fine touch. There might be a subtle difference there, you might be right. But you could probably have you know, approximately the same you know, finesse in end effector space, in fact, Really, if I care about um, contact, or contact at the end effector, then I should probably get more finesse out of pushing it down to their controller. But that is sort of actually the, I, I, that is sort of the problem. The, the thing hiding in the end effector control or the, the um, you know, all of the sort of contact control is that Jacobian assumes that you know where the contact is happening, okay? The, the implicit in the assumption is that like I'm only making contact at the end of my tip, my tool tip. And if I'm a, like a robot reaching into the sink or operating around, I can make contact anywhere. And, and unless you have to stop and estimate the contact, then, um, then it's not even, you know, your Jacobian's gonna change, right? So, so choosing a priori, a single contact in order to, you know, a single contact Jacobian in order to write my end effector impedance around is a limiting assumption in my mind. And it's, I would rather uh, have the ability to act as a soft robot in joint space and detect contact, change the location of my contact, even if it, it costs me some bandwidth, right? Okay, 
so um, how do we actually use the, the, so even in that dish loading example, uh, we did not program a particular uh, stiffness in hand coordinates, right? We just asked the robot to be generally soft. Now, here's another question for you. So how does, um, how does being a joint impedance, how does joint impedance control mode differ from having a PD controlled robot? What advantage am I getting? Because it looks, you know, that, that controller looks a lot like a PD controller, right? The, the terms I'm adding in here are basically a PD controller. So I've been saying this whole time, you know, force control, you know, torque controlled robots are cool. You can do great things. You know, you're limited if you're using a position controlled robot. And I've also said that you should do PD control on a position controlled robot. So what gives, what is the difference here that I'm getting out of effectively writing this position controller um, in my joint impedance control? It's an important point. The big, I am basically doing position control, but I'm not only doing position, you know, PD control. I'm doing PD control plus gravity compensation plus friction compensation, okay? So basically, you know, the PD control of the stiff geared ro robot is trying to use position, you know, error, error controlled position and, and uh, you know, velocity gains to overcome all the messiness in the, in the gearbox and in the unknown parameters of the robot potentially. Um, here, the philosophy is very different First of all, it's like anything we can know about the robot, you should subtract that out and cancel that out to the way, to the extent that you can. Um, and and why is that good? Well, two things. First of all, if I um, on my original PD control, if I command a certain um, join angle, then I'm not going to achieve that exactly at steady state. I'm going to achieve whatever the, you know, I'm going to achieve a, a set point that is below, let's say. Uh, so that the error that I'm commanding from my PD controller balances gravity. So I won't actually have the zero set point, the steady state solution be at the joints I commanded. If I can subtract out gravity, right, then, um, then actually the set point that I'm commanding will be the steady state when I'm not in contact. So that's a big difference. Also, the, um, you know, the friction compensation is a big deal. So if I can, you know, if I want to operate at low speeds, or for instance, the ability to actively cancel out those frictions, that's a that's a big difference. Um, <clears throat> but I think the the maybe the biggest important point there is that because I'm not trying to cancel out all that other stuff I don't know, and I'm only trying that the terms that I'm adding here that are left over are really left over just to handle the external forces. It allows me to command my stiffness response to those external forces directly. And it allows me to set them much smaller than I would otherwise. Like the, I can act like a, so, a soft robot with a KUKA that's trying to subtract everything off. If I just set the, my PD gains low on a UR5, it'll just kind of like, <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be useless, okay? So the, the, the important difference here of joint impedance control is that you can set very soft gains, potentially relatively soft gains, um, and and have that more compliant behavior. So the dish loading, we're just setting, asking the positions to be a little bit flexible, commanding our best guess at the orientation of the of the hand to, to get in and the arc of the um, dishes. But if it's off, it will just deviate in joint angle trajectory from that and still accomplish the task, right? Without I mean, you will actually, if you do that with a position controlled robot and you're a little off, you will fault your robot or you'll, you know, it, the robot will just complain and it'll, you know, or you'll break an end effector or there's all kinds of different things that could happen. Cool. So, um, so now 
how do we actually do it for, um, for the EWA, right? So the EWA's interface is a position control, a position command only, and then this extra feed forward torque, right? The output is the position commanded, position measured, a little weird that those are, you know, it seems like, why is it, why is it outputting the command that you put in when you sent it over here? Those can be different and I'll show you a case where they are, all right? Um, and the uh, EWA velocity estimated, the EWA state estimated, okay, torque commanded, torque measured, torque external. This is the important one. If you wanna measure contact forces, the torque external is my tau ex external. Okay, um, it doesn't take velocity commands in. I, I have wondered about that in the past. It's kind of like you're handicapping my ability to do higher um, gain control. They internally will differentiate the commands that you're sending and send, uh, you know, use velocity in their PD controller, but they will, they'll do that themselves. And I, and I have to believe that's maybe just like trying to make, I mean, I guess uh, trying to avoid people sending, uh, you know, bad velocity commands that could uh, affect the passivity arguments or something like that. Okay, so, um, you know, we choose to go in impedance control, joint impedance control mode. These are sort of typical gains. Awesome. You can put a six axis force torque sensor on the end. And in fact, in the classic papers of the EWA, of the EWA and even the, um, I think in the videos I just showed, they're only using the joint torque, I believe. Um, and that I think they did in the initial papers have that force torque sensor as an extra bit of information, but that performance that we saw is just due to the joint torque sensing. And the cheat port, right? So the contact forces, so, Contact results come through as um, you know as a cheat. I say you you don't have those. If you have a force torque sensor on your wrist, you could imagine effectively getting us a, a noisy version of this in, and we can model that. There's an extra block you can put in that would pull off the state basically, and uh, the torques basically, and 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 estimate the a noisy version of the six axis force torque sensor. So we put this thing in a you know relatively soft. If you remember the um, this is in joint space. So this is the 800 is the base link of the, you know, the, the basically the shoulder kind of joint and they get smaller as they go up. And if you remember how soft it was when he was in the 100, 200 regime, that's a, that's a relatively soft um, joint uh, stiffness. Okay. And we worked really hard setting our damping coefficients. <laughs> um, I, this was just one robot one day. I'm not sure that it's always exactly just ones. Okay. Um, if you if you look closely at the at the response that you're getting out of this out of the system, if you command a step change in um, in in joint position, this is just joint seven. Okay. Then the output joint command, which you would think might just echo your actual joint command, looks different. Right. It actually doesn't look like a perfect step. And this is the result of the velocity, internal velocity estimation that, that's happening. So it, it sends an effective joint command that looks like this. And you get a, a, the joint trajectory that follows the measured joint trajectory looks like this. You know, the, the delay is pretty, pretty modest, pretty reasonable. The, the th I, I hate the fact that it goes backwards. <laughs> um, we have broken a finger once because of that. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, uh, it was it was touching the table and not in impedance mode, and try to jog it out of the way, and it went down first into the table and broke a knuckle. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a super good point. Just be aware, it goes the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, um, but but given those caveats, you know, you can you can. Uh, do beautiful things with that robot that I think would be very hard to do with a, you know, with a stiff robot. So that was my attempt to cut, um, you know, the big idea. So let me say the big ideas again. The biggest idea of all is that, well, okay, first you can, it's good to think about forces sometimes. You can program forces indirectly by programming yourself as a mechanical system and by knowing only the robot's dynamics and the robot's parameters, you can often program yourself to act like a very interesting mechanical system, knowing, assuming nothing about the environment, okay? Um, the joint impedance control is sort of 
halfway there, right? So it allows you to command extra forces on top if you like, but roughly act as a compliant robot as you're moving through the world. And if you make incidental contact, you know, in random places, we do actually have some, um, some work on trying to estimate exactly the location of that contact. And there are people that are building robot skins that are trying to estimate the location of that contact. But already there's a lot of advantages of just moving through the world, whether you're trying to do a precise task or just not break things in the world by being a little bit soft. And it matters even if you're doing RL. Right on. Any last questions? I hope you play with the, the notebooks, you know, and there's like, you can make a shiny orange chunk hand that's in, in virtual impedance mode and all that good stuff, right? Lots of little options. All right, I'll hang out for a minute if anybody has any questions, but otherwise we'll see you Thursday. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy that my new setup worked this time.